All right, quick question. Let's imagine that you at last had sea, you haven't been able to shave for a whole week, and you don't know where you are. You don't know your latitude, which is how far north you are above the equator. You don't know your longitude, how far west you've traveled since leaving Europe. And you don't know your direction, which way is north, south, west, and east. How can you figure that out? And no cheating, you're not allowed to use a GPS on your phone. Well, that's the kind of question that Christopher Columbus would have faced in 1492, and he had an answer for most of those. And that will lead us into the general question of how was he able to travel from Spain to the Caribbean, and also what kind of motives would push him to undertake such a dangerous journey, and ultimately how do we view him uh, today, 500 years after his death. Stay tuned. So I have you thought about that issue, about latitude, longitude, and then direction. Let's start with direction, which might be the easier. Uh, you all know that if you look at the closest star to us, and that would be the Sun, from our perspective on Earth, it appears to be rising from the east and then setting in the west. Uh, it's not actually moving, it's just that the Earth is rotating on its axis. So from our perspective, the Sun appears to be moving. If you happen to be at night and you can't see the sun because our Earth is facing the other way, well, by that point, you can actually see the stars in the sky. And most of them, if you look long enough, appear to be moving slowly. And again, it's because the Earth is rotating around the axis. But the star that is located just above the north axis of the, um, of the Earth, and that would be Polaris, also known as the North Star, would seem, from our perspective, to be stable. And so that would be the kind of knowledge that would be known to ancient mariners going back to ancient times. And this way you can know which way is north and east and south uh, during the day looking at the sun or at night looking at Polaris, at least if you are in the northern hemisphere. The southern hemisphere is a bit more complicated. Well, what if uh, you live in England and the weather is not always the greatest and it's foggy and you can't see the sun or you can't see the stars at night? Well, that's where a Chinese invention would be coming handy, and that's the compass which is invented in China, but is available in Europe at the time Columbus set sail. So how does it work? Well, it's based on the magnetic properties of the Earth. The Earth has some uh, molten iron inside, and I'm not sure about the physics exactly, but if you have a whole bunch of molten iron and it's spinning and churning, it will create a big magnetic field. And so as it happens, the Earth not only has a North Pole that is a geographic North that is based on the axis and how the Earth is spinning, but it also has a magnetic north based on its magnetic field. And the two are not exactly the same. And actually, the magnetic north is moving slowly. And even in a long geological span, it might shift altogether to the South Pole and back up. But for our perspective, if you're sailing next to the equator, the geographic north and the uh, magnetic north are pretty much the same. So at night or during the day, whether it's foggy or not, you can just use your compass and know your direction. And Columbus had that. What about the second question, which is your latitude, how far north you are above the equator? And there the key is just to look at the sun and uh, how high it is above the horizon. Uh, the reason being that the Earth is a sphere and we're slightly tilted. Uh, so if you are located right on the equator at noon, the sun uh, will appear to be uh, right in front of you, meaning at the zenith, right above you at noon. However, if you are close to the North Pole, uh, the sun will appear at an angle to you even at noon. It will be fairly low on the horizon. And so uh, you can tell your latitude based on that. If you're in Norway, it means at noon, the sun is rather low above the horizon. And then uh, if you're in uh, Kenya, at noon, it will be right above your head. It's a bit more complicated because that shifts with the season, but you get uh, the idea. So all you need is an instrument uh, that will just calculate the angle of the sun above the horizon. And that's it. You're in business. Uh, there is a pretty primitive but workable uh, instrument that was invented by the Arabs. It's called the cross staff. And then you have a more elaborate version of that that is called the sextant. And both of them work on the same principle of calculating the angle of the sun above the horizon. And that's available by the time Columbus set sail. So he could tell his latitude. He knew that he was, I don't know, 20 degrees north above the equator. The longitude, that's the more complicated part. To do that, you would need a good, accurate watch. Let me explain. Let's say you set sail from Spain and you end up where I am right now, which is in Louisiana. 
when you left from Spain, you set your watch to local noon, meaning when the sun was at its highest above the horizon in Spain, you set uh, your watch to noon. However, when you reach Louisiana, because you're so far away from your original uh, point of departure, when locally in Louisiana the sun is at uh, noon above your head, uh, your watch tells you that it's actually 7 p.m. because it's already 7 in Spain. You have moved seven time zones away. And just by comparing, by comparing uh, what your watch is telling you to what the sun uh, is telling you, you can see how far away you have traveled from your point of departure. Uh, at least as long as you have a good, accurate watch. And that will give you the minutes and the seconds. And then you can tell within like 10, 10 or 15 miles uh, how far west or east you are, your line of longitude. Uh, the people in the time of Columbus understood the mechanics of that, the theory of it. Uh, they have uh, accurate, uh, big clocks that you can put in a church steeple. But the minute you put that cumbersome mechanism on a ship and you start rocking and rolling, and there's heat and cold and wet and salt, uh, that clock will be uh, hopelessly out of whack after a week or two. And so by the time you get to the Caribbean, uh, the clock might be uh, four hours off, meaning that it's completely useless when it comes to calculating your longitude. So what do you do in that case? You do dead reckoning. Reckoning as in, I reckon that I'm somewhere around here. And that's just an estimate, basically. Uh, you leave from Spain and you try to calculate your speed. And you do that with a chip log, which means you have kind of a weight and then a long line of rope with some knots every so many uh, feet or so, and you throw it at sea when you're navigating, and based on how fast uh, the, uh, uh, the knots are moving in a given amount of time, and you use a little clock for that, uh, then you can tell how fast you're moving in knots. That's the origin of the expression. And if you do that often enough, you could say, well, I was traveling at three knots uh, for 12 hours, so I have moved 36 nautical miles. The problem with this is that you are comparing your speed to the waters around you that might be moving due to ocean currents. And then you might hit upon a storm that will carry you very fast uh, for a few days and you lose track of how much distance you've covered. All the speed might vary uh, all the time and so it's kind of difficult to know how many miles you've uh, traveled in a day. So altogether that reckoning system was quite inaccurate. And that could lead to some serious issues in the early 1700s uh, you have a disaster whereby a British fleet was coming back to England and that British fleet uh, assumed that it was still safely far out at sea when in reality it had made far more progress uh, longitude-wise than it thought and they just crashed into those silly island, not silly as in crazy, but S-C-I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. And then you have the loss of several thousand sailors and a whole British fleet as a result. Uh, after that, the British Admiralty decided to set up a competition whereby they would offer a very generous prize to whatever inventor could come up with a good maritime watch that would remain accurate uh, for weeks and weeks at sea and thus allow uh, sailors in the British Navy to know their longitude. It took several decades, but eventually by 1761, if my memory serves me right, we have Morrison who developed a watch called the H4 that worked at sea uh, for a long period of time. And so from that point forward to 1760s, people can finally calculate their longitude. Nowadays, you just take out your phone and use a GPS, but that's not available to the general public until the 1990s. So as far as uh, Columbus is concerned, he can figure out his direction, his latitude, and roughly his longitude, and that's kind of enough to dare himself to go into the open seas. What else would be necessary to undergo the time of exploration? Well, you need a good ship. And the kind of ships that were traditional in Europe were more like of a galley type, going back to the triremes of the ancient Greeks and the Romans. Uh, which partly used some oars or a large square sail. So they were called square rigged. And a square sail works pretty well as long as uh, the wind is coming from behind you or three quarters behind you. However, it's very bad at tacking against the wind, meaning uh, being a close hold, close to the wind or against the wind altogether. Uh, so if you had no wind or winds that were kind of headwinds, uh, then you would just get the sail down and start rowing, which is okay if you're just going from one spot uh, in the Mediterranean to another, uh, that's a small scene. If you're trying to cross the Atlantic, that might be an issue. And that kind of square rig uh, was still in use in uh, Middle Ages. Uh, you've all heard of the Vikings and the longboats that they have are pretty similar. They also only have a square rig. But in the case of the Vikings, they did manage to use that to hop onto Iceland and then Greenland uh, and then even Newfoundland. Another kind of sail that is uh, useful in sailing is one that is more triangular, uh, which is sometimes referred to as a Latin sail, 
Nowadays, you would call that a jib, and that's a triangular sail that you'll see usually in the front of the ship. Uh, it's a Latin sail because it comes from the Mediterranean or more the Arabic world, and you'll still see it used in some ships on the Nile River, like the Philokans. And the good thing about it is that it's very good at sailing close to the wind, uh, which is useful if the wind is uh, in front of you, you can tack against the wind using zigzags or a sail at an angle to it. And so by the time of Columbus, his ships would have both the square rig and the Latin sail, which would allow him to handle whatever wind uh, that mother nature might throw at him. So that was kind of a versatile kind of set of sails to explore wherever you want to go. Uh, the ship that Columbus used was not a trireme, uh, it was not a Viking longboat, it would be what is known as a caravel. Uh, it has something to do with the way the planks are set around the hull, they are carville built. Uh, what's so special about them? Well, they're not that big. I remember visiting a replica of the Santa Maria, his flagship, and I was impressed by how small this thing is. Uh, they typically are not armed much, they're not warships, they're for trade, uh, they tend to be kind of round so that they can carry cargo. Uh, they're quite sturdy, which is important, the North Atlantic seas tend to be rough, so you want to withstand that. Uh, they also happen to have a uh, rudder in the back that is in line with the ship. It's called a stern-mounted rudder. What's so special about it? Well, it's a Chinese invention, yet again. Uh, whereas in Europe, traditionally, the stern, the, the rudder had been placed to the side of the ship. That's what is used for Viking longboats or triremes. And that makes your ship more maneuverable. And that's still the kind of rudder that you have nowadays. And pretty much the whole idea about a square rig and a jib and all of these are still employed in modern sailing ships. So Columbus had a versatile ship that he could use on the high seas. Uh, the last thing that you need is some navigational techniques. And Columbus, for all his faults, was a very good navigator. And he and Portuguese explorers developed a technique that was known as the Volta do Mar, which simply means uh, to go out and do a detour at sea. Because sometimes at sea, going straight in the line is not the fastest way to go. Uh, it's best not to go straight at the Caribbean because the dominant winds coming from Western Europe come from the west, so you will have headwinds along the way. So it's better in that case to go down south out of your way all the way to the coast of Africa, at which point you're going to hit uh, what are called the trade winds, which are very reliable winds that will blow from Africa to the Caribbean at something like 10, 20 knots and will push you across the Atlantic in record time. On the way back, however, you don't want to come back the way you came and have headwinds, so it's better to go north along the coast of Florida, even into what is the United States today, until you get those westerlies, uh, the western winds of the North Atlantic, and they will push you back to Europe. Uh, this has something to do with yet another physics effect that I can't quite explain to you. It's called the Coriolis effect, uh, but it has to do with the fact that in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the winds will be turning in a clockwise motion, and the Southern Hemisphere will be a counterclockwise motion. Uh, the Portuguese also discovered that when they eventually went to India, you can use the local winds in your favor. As you get to the Indian Ocean, the dominant winds there are not called the trade winds, they will be called the monsoon winds, and about half the year they will be flowing from south to north, and they are the ones that bring moisture to India during the monsoon, and the other half of the year they'll be blowing from north uh, to south. And so if you time your voyage just right, you can go to India with favorable winds, buy your spices, and go away uh, again in record time. So with all these uh, navigation techniques, uh, Columbus and the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, were able to sail on the open seas. What about the second question that I want to look at today? We figured out how uh, Columbus was able to go on the high seas. The second question of some importance would be, why would he want to do that in the first place? Um, because it seems like a very dangerous journey and you don't know what is on the other side. Well, if you listen to your world history teacher back in primary school, you understand that there are three G's uh, that are of importance. Gold, God, and glory. Uh, so let's start with God that tends to be emphasized the most by contemporaries because it sounds a bit less crass uh, than saying I'm doing that just for the money. That was especially true in the case of Spain where the queen was Isabella la Catolica, a very Catholic queen of Spain, and especially within the context of 1492. This is a year that is very important to the history of Spain on three levels. The first one is that it marked the end of the Reconquista, the reconquest of Spain. And uh, that meant that for 700 years, parts of Spain had been occupied uh, by Muslim invaders in the south, and then Christian kings in the north had tried to push them out. That's what the reconquest is. It's a very, very long, slow process. But by 1492, he was completed when the last Muslim stronghold in the south, it was called Granada, uh, was conquered by Isabella. 
that same year, uh, she also decided to expel the Jewish people from Spain. And there used to be a significant Jewish minority in school. So those uh, Jewish people that are known often as uh, Sephardic Jews, Jews that came from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, they eventually had to be dispatched. Some of them went to Northern Europe, uh, like Amsterdam, or to North Africa, like Algeria, but quite a few of them eventually went to the New World, and actually one of them is on the first voyage with Columbus. Uh, also important would be the issue of uh, glory, because Columbus, like many of the conquistadors, those early conquerors, comes from kind of a middling spot in European society. If you're extremely poor, uh, then you don't have the kind of expertise, training, contacts with royalty that would allow you to prepare a voyage of ex expedition. If, on the other hand, you're at the very top of a society, you're a king or a duke or something, you have plenty of money in Europe, why would you risk your life crossing the Atlantic? So the people that usually do those voyages of exploration, that would include Columbus, uh, would be from the bourgeoisie or the lower nobility, people who have high aspirations that they can't quite fulfill in Europe, and they're hoping that the Americans or whatever lies beyond the sea uh, might be the, uh, the, the big way for them uh, to become important. And when Columbus negotiated the contract with Isabella, he made sure to uh, obtain that he would be appointed as viceroy of conquered lands, and that he would acquire titles of nobility, and that these would be passed on uh, to his sons after him, and so he would start a kind of a dynasty in the New World. So glory is very important to him. And let's finish with uh, gold, meaning profit in general, and that's probably the most important of the lot. How did Columbus hope to make money in that voyage? Well, initially the plan is to do the spice trade because he was not hoping to discover America, he was trying to get to Asia. So knowing that the Earth is round, he figured if I keep sailing west, I'll end up in Asia, right? That would make sense. Obviously, he did not know of the existence of the American continent that would kind of uh, block the way. And he also assumed that the Earth is far smaller than it actually is. So he thought that by the time he would get to the middle of the Atlantic, well, Japan and China would be kind of right there. Uh, and he was quite mistaken in that regard. Once Columbus got to the Caribbean, uh, profit was clearly on his uh, mind as well. Uh, we have his log entry for October 13th, like the day after he first landed in the Bahamas, and you notice that he talks about the local indigenous people being uh, strong and well-built, but also not knowing about steel and weapons, and so they would make, quote, good servants. So he figured there's no spices, but maybe I could enslave the local people. And he also noticed that they had gold trinkets uh, on them, so he figured that might be another way to make money. He keeps asking them, where's the gold? Where's the gold? As it turned out, there's not much gold in the Caribbean, but that definitely was at the top of his concern. Uh, so gold, uh, free labor, and normally spices, so he didn't end up in Asia. So that's kind of the, the motives there. As to the voyages uh, themselves, uh, Columbus left in uh, summer of 1492, sailed across the Atlantic in the uh, summer and fall, and there he was pretty lucky because you all know that this is a hurricane season where usually a lot of hurricanes will make their way, well, from Africa to the Caribbean following the trade winds. Uh, he was extremely lucky in that sense, uh, sailed in a very dangerous season and somehow escaped all that. Uh, along the way, he realized that the Atlantic was far bigger than he thought, so he simply lied on his log. Uh, telling his crew that he had not traveled much, when in reality they had covered far more ground. And since people can't calculate their longitude, it's kind of easy to, to lie to your crew. Until October 12, 1492, he did end up in an island that he called San Salvador, the Holy Savior, uh, except uh, the local people called it Guanahani, and nowadays we think that it would be Wetlings Island and what is today the Bahamas. Uh, that's where you have that very famous encounter of two worlds where he would meet the local Indian population. In that case, uh, these people would be called the Taino Indians of the Bahamas. They're a Native American group that used to be quite dominant in Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Jamaica, and Puerto Rico. Uh, the other people living in the Caribbean would be living in the smaller islands to the southeast. They were called the Caribs, and they're the ones that eventually gave their name to the region, the Caribbean Sea. Uh, you notice, as uh, I said, that they were well built, would make good servants, and did not know of steel and weapons, but they're also very few, and the island is small, so he asked them, where is the gold? And it told him, go south to a place that we called Cuba. And it's kind of difficult to know what is the motive of the Indians on the other side, because they're illiterate, and so we don't have accounts from their side. So you have to kind of read between the lines to figure out what they mean. Uh, how did they process that encounter with those strange people coming from the east on those big ships? And why did they tell him to go to the south? Are they being helpful like he thought they were? Or are they uh, understood that those people are dangerous and let's just get them on their merry way? We don't know. Uh, they're 
view of experiencing the past has been lost to us. Uh, so you go to Cuba, and then uh, from there proceeded all the way to what is today Haiti and the Dominican Republic, an island that they called Hispaniola, it's a Spanish island. And by that point, it's Christmas of 1492, so I retired to his cabin to have a bit of uh, fun, I assume lonely drinking. So the command kind of passed all the way uh, down to the cabin boy at the bottom, who had a, a lot of fun on Christmas Eve, a uh, little joyride, and so much so that he wrecked the ship into some reefs that were not too far from uh, Cap Haitien in northern Haiti today. And so this is how he lost his flagship, the Santa Maria. Oops, to make things worse, the other ship on his uh, fleet uh, was uh, led by a captain called Pinzon, who mutinied and then headed back to Spain uh, on his own. So he was left with just a third ship on the, uh, uh, on the fleet, and that would be the Nina, the tiny one. With the remnants from the Santa Maria, Columbus built a settlement there in northern Haiti, and he called that Fort Navidad, Fort Christmas. This is kind of a mysterious settlement because when Columbus came back on his second voyage, uh, the local Spanish uh, sailor that he had left there uh, had been killed and the settlement had been destroyed. So still to the present time, there is some disagreement as to where this might be located. We know it's in northern Haiti, but the actual remnants have not been found with certainty. And same thing with the location of the wreck. I remember visiting Port-au-Prince with a museum there where they'll show you uh, the anchor of the ship of Columbus, uh, but it's still in to degree as to whether that's the real thing. Uh, we're not sure for real that we have found the wreck of the Santa Maria. So next time you go to Haiti on vacation, bring a bathing suit to go uh, 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 swimming in the beautiful northern coast of Haiti and try to find uh, the wreck of Columbus and then bring a shovel to look for uh, uh, the Fort Navidad as well. Anyway, by that point he had seen enough and he came back to Spain, amazingly arrived back in Spain the very same day that Pinson did as well, and reported on his great findings. After that he did three more uh, voyages, uh, second, third and fourth. Uh, the second one was more one of settlement, where he established a more permanent settlement at Isabella and then Santo Domingo, which is still the capital of the Dominican Republic today. And in the next video we'll talk about the Spanish settlement in the Caribbean, so we'll get back to that in more detail. And then he also explored various islands of the Caribbean, as well as the mainland, the actual American continent proper in Central America. So obviously he was still not quite aware that he had found a new continent. Uh, as such, he was in a lifetime seen as a bit of a failure, because as it turned out, there is not that much gold in the Caribbean. And he exploited the local Taino population so much that between the violence and the diseases that introduced, that population was wiped out within a generation or two. And so uh, whatever money you could make by the spices, well, that was not there. Uh, by enslaving the local people, that's not there as well. And same thing for the gold. Uh, so he was seen as kind of a failure in his lifetime. In fact, angry colonists sent him back to Spain in chains because they thought he had been a terrible governor. Uh, the later conquistadors were far more successful. Some of them headed to Mexico. They found a much more magnificent civilization than the Tainos, they were. That's the one that lived in Tenochtitlan, present-day Mexico City. So when the Spanish conquered that colony, which they renamed New Spain, we call that Mexico today, uh, that was a major money maker. And then further south, another conquistador, Francisco Pizarro, found another magnificent empire. That would be the empire of the Incas, the Quechua people of South America, roughly Peru and Bolivia today. And they happen to have plenty of silver in the mine of Potosi in Bolivia, as well as gold mines. So these were much bigger money makers than uh, Columbus uh, ever managed to achieve. So his role in history is more as a the pioneer. In the next few videos, we will study the impact of the voyages of Columbus for the centuries of European colonization of the Caribbean. We will focus specifically on the issue of forced labor, such as the institution of repartimiento that was inflicted upon the Taino Indians in the early 1500s, then the indentured servitude that was prevalent in the Caribbean in the 1600s, and topping off with the Atlantic slave trade of the 1700s, leading all the way to the Haitian Revolution. Before I sign off, however, I would like to finish by talking a bit about historiography. And historiography simply means the way that history has changed over time, or at least the way we interpret history. Because most lay people who are not too familiar with the historical profession always assume that history is pretty set in stone, that it's the science and that facts happen and that's it. I'm here with a voice of authority telling you how the past unfolded. The reality is a bit more complicated uh, for two reasons. Uh, the first one is that the sources are not always the best. I mentioned earlier how we have no accounts from the side of the Taino Indians. We only have the Spanish accounts. And even those can be a bit incomplete uh, because especially for the first voyage, there are fairly few sources uh, authored even by Columbus. And on top of that, he was lying quite often in order to uh, lie to his sailors about how much uh, room, how much distance he had covered. 
and also uh, lying to his patrons, telling them that things were far greater than they were so that he would keep getting funding. So the sources are not always uh, perfect and we keep finding new sources. So as this goes along, we are forced to revisit the past. Uh, the second major issue is one of bias because the sources are written with a bias and also historians themselves come with their own bias and even by looking at the same sources, historians can come to different conclusions. Now I already mentioned how Columbus in his lifetime uh, was kind of a controversial figure. Uh, some, of, uh, some of the people looked at him as being a, a great figure who discovered a new world and others uh, like the colonists were disappointed that the, by the fact that he had not discovered as much gold as they were hoping. And some people from England or France were kind of jealous at the success of Spain and they spread what is called the Black Legend, uh, stories about all the atrocities that the Spanish, like Columbus, would have committed uh, in uh, the Caribbean. And when I say a Spanish like Columbus, it's a bit of a misnomer. Columbus originally was from Genoa, Italy. And uh, that kind of uh, conflicted views about Columbus have uh, also continued ever since. In the United States, for the longest time, he was viewed as a great hero. Uh, the capital, Washington, is kind of named after him. It's the District of Columbia uh, after him. And you have Columbus, Ohio, Columbia, South Carolina, and these are named after him, or the Columbia River in the Pacific Northwest, or Latin America, the whole country of uh, Colombia. And for the longest time, you would have celebrated as an American Columbus Day, October 12th, uh, to celebrate him. Uh, this kind of lasted up until, I would say, 1992, where you have the 500-year anniversary and during that time, Hollywood planned two movies about Columbus for the same year, and there were big celebrations planned until people started criticizing Columbus, especially Native American groups uh, who said, well, he came to conquer us, and by the way, he did not discover America. We were there first. We are the true discoverers. He's not even the first European to come to the Americas. The Vikings did that around the year 1000. So he is more a perpetrator of uh, mass murder. He is more like a Hitler in our mind. He's a genocidal mania. At the same time, you have kind of a pushback, uh, especially coming from, say, Italian Americans. And it's because he's Italian, uh, Italian Americans see uh, Columbus as kind of their patron saint, the first Italian in the Americas. That is also true of Hispanics in the Caribbean. Uh, people living in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic are often of Hispanic descent, and they tend to view the conquest more from the Hispanic perspective because, well, there are very few indigenous people left in the Caribbean today. Uh, so you may uh, visit a place like the Dominican Republic, and there there will be a huge monument in honor of Columbus, including what is supposed to be a mausoleum, an elaborate tomb in honor where he is supposed to have been buried. And if you go to Havana, there's a place where for a long time they said they had the body of uh, Columbus and they would honor him there as well. And then you go to Sevilla in Spain, in the cathedral, there is an elaborate tomb for Columbus where his body is supposed to be as well. So on three different spots, people love him enough that they claim to have the body. And that's another good example of how the past is complicated. Uh, you have three different places that claim to have the body of Columbus. And so if you want to earn some extra credit in the class, once you are done finding the remains of the Santa Maria and the true location of Fort Navidad, pick up your shovel again and try to figure out where the true body of Christopher Columbus might be today. Have fun. So that's it about what I have to say about Columbus and the conflicted ways in which we view the past. Next time we'll still remain in the Haiti Dominican Republic area and we'll see what happens after 1492 and the introduction of new diseases and forced labor and the wiping out of the Taino population. See you next time.